Believe it or not, Beyond Earth is not the first time an entire Civ game was built to explore what happens after a science victory in a different Civ game. Wikipedia swears up and down that Alpha Centauri is part of the mainline Civ series, so if it's weird to think that Civ has a canon now, just think about how weird it is to know that Civ has apparently had a canon this whole time. Civilization Beyond Earth is a turn-based strategy game that plays, looks, sounds, and feels a whole lot like Civ V. Except instead of playing with an alternate historical timeline of an alternate Earth, this game has you playing with a fictional futuristic timeline of a fictional Earth-like planet. In the dark and pessimistic future of 24 whenever, Earth is pretty much screwed, so the last bastion of humanity decides they'd be better off traveling for hundreds of years away to stake a fresh start on an alien planet. They're totally alone on this strange new world, which throws everything they know about physics and biology out the window. So while basic texts have to be re-researched, you also have to redevelop an entire global economy from scratch. But despite its setting, there is nothing alien about what makes this game tick. If you've played any of the civs before, then you probably know how and why this one can keep you up all night for days. It's the same brilliant work of addictive but not exploitive game design that makes every turn feel like it could be the game-breaking moment. The benefit of being turn-based is that it gives the player all the time in the world to stop and think about the exaggerated importance of all the little micro decisions that make up a game. Each and every turn feels like it could harbor either the dreadful death or the glorious victory of your entire strategy. The only way to know for sure is to keep playing for just one more turn. I ended up playing this game for over 50 hours for the past two weeks, and I had a lot of fun with it, but I'm about to talk a lot of shit about it, so keep that in mind. It may be the worst Civ game I've played, but it's still a Civ game, which means it's still pretty great. But some common problems that all the Civ games have had are exacerbated in this one. Towards the mid to late game, all those compelling little micro decisions pile up into a mass of increasingly meaningless busywork that doesn't exactly scale well with the larger size of a late game Civ. In order to be meaningful in the first place, there has to be some convincing risks and rewards to the outcomes of all those little decisions, all of which mean a lot in the early game and very little in the later game. And Beyond Earth, in particular, has a lot of buildings, a lot of quest outcomes, and a lot of little bonuses and perks that just amount to single-digit increases that are too easy to forget about and lose track of to no significant consequence. Once the whole map is revealed, once your economy is balanced and your military is nice and overpowered, there's little reason to keep building buildings. In fact, a lot of the earlier defense structures are effectively useless by the time you figure out this game's quirks. Like, here's one, the Ultrasonic Fence. It prevents these alien beasts, which are kind of like barbarians in this game, from approaching cities within two tiles. That might be useful if you're playing as an aggressive military civ, but only for, say, the first 15 turns, to protect only your first city. What kills the usefulness of that building, and makes it almost entirely pointless, is that aliens aren't aggressive enough to be attacking your cities in the first place. In fact, out of 50 hours of playing, I never saw an alien attack one of my cities at all. They'll occasionally slap an outlying military unit, and they will rubber band against you in mass if you farm them for EXP. But if you don't, you can generally ignore them. You can build a city three tiles away from an alien nest, and they won't do anything about it. Even then, you don't have to build an ultrasonic fence, but the game will keep bugging you two throughout the entire length of the entire match. So the lack of interesting buildings to build means there's less big investments to make city side, which means there's less specialization for you to steer your cities towards, which means there's a bit less strategic depth to micromanaging your economy in this one. I think the lack of thought put into this game's systems and lore is most evident when you build a wonder. Yay, I built a stellar codex. What, what is that? What, what am I looking at? In order to answer those questions, you have to right-click your Stellar Codex to open up the Civilopedia, where you can find a wall of text explaining just what the hell it is. But there's no reason to read all that flavor text when the important stuff you really need to know is up there. It's the same deal with the quests, which attempt to give this very iconic, number-driven game a bit of narrative. However, it's easy to ignore the giant block of pulp fiction contextualizing a quest when all the info you really need, icons and numbers and all, is right down there. 
That's a lot of what kills the magic of this theme. The mechanics and the UI don't reflect or incorporate the lore and the story it's trying to tell. One essential theme is the idea that you're colonizing a planet that belonged to the aliens first, so you have to figure out if you want to coexist with them, or domesticate them, or just exterminate them. And those three solutions are supposed to match up with the three affinity upgrade branches. But they don't reflect any particular playstyle, so much as they reflect what upgrades you're going to click on based on what resources are lying around your starting cities. For example, the Harmony branch is supposed to evolve your sieve into one that respects and adapts to the alien planet. But there's nothing stopping you from killing aliens, burning up fossil fuels, and generally waging unrestrained wars against everything on your way there. And because of their rubber banding AI and the later game utility of their resources, there are very few strategic reasons to worry about the aliens at all. They're an easy way to farm XP for your military, but that's probably their only real use, both for and against the player. They take the role of barbarians, but unlike barbarians, they are safe to ignore, which makes them less interesting to play with. Also, out of 50 hours of playing, the other civs only declared war on me once. With both the rival humans and the indigenous factions being fairly peaceful, there's not much of a danger to develop your military for, which means the quickest and least challenging victory conditions are going to be the economic ones that task you with building some really big, really important building, which is always the least interesting way to play and end a game of Civ. And once you do end it, and I mean I guess some people might consider this a spoiler, but once a match is won, what, what is this? You just get a card with some art and a line reading, and that's it? And it's the same art they use for the victory menu you see at the very beginning. It, it, where's all that super detailed data that clued you into what the other factions were doing that whole time? It turns out you just get booted to the main menu where you might find those charts. They're called replays for some reason, and you don't get that cool animated political map no matter where you look. This is no way to sum up and reflect on a nerve-wracking 15-hour game of delicate strategy and management. It's an incredibly anticlimactic and uninteresting way to celebrate a hard-won victory. Come to think of it, just about everything thematically in this whole game is less interesting than its predecessors. Hell, George Washington had way more personality, humor, and charm to him than Samatar Jamabar ever will. Despite my gripes with the gameplay, the thing Beyond Earth needed most, and also what Alpha Centauri had in spades, is a good dose of personality. It needed a way to incorporate its lore into the UI and gameplay better. It needed to double down on the quality of its fiction, since it couldn't rely on actual, non-fictional history to contextualize the game world for it. In Alpha Centauri, when you had to talk to another leader, you had to patch him through to Line 7 and put him on the main screen to hear his personalized greeting based on which specific faction you were playing and how you were specifically playing it at what specific time. Compared to that, everyone in Beyond Earth delivers painfully canned lines. That being said though, it is still Civ, which means I could probably play it till the end of time. I'm 50 hours in and I'm not totally bored of it yet, despite all those problems. But maybe its biggest problem is that it doesn't really have a place in the market. As it stands now, there's absolutely no reason to buy this over the Civ 5 Complete Edition. Beyond Earth should not be your first Civ game, and if you're already a fan of the franchise, then the Complete Civ 5 is probably massive enough to still keep you more occupied than a new one. The situation reminds me a lot of how Civ games, much like the Civs themselves, rise to greatness through expansion and iteration. Beyond Earth is at least more compelling and addicting than the vanilla Civ 5 was, but it's hard to imagine where it can expand from here, when the whole concept is already so close to an expansion pack to begin with. It feels like an expensive DLC or a light sequel. Not a full $50 release, especially when new and higher rated sci-fi themed 4X games are a dime a dozen if you know where to look. It's not Alpha Centauri 2, nor is it something worthy of a whole new franchise. It's just Civ 5 with all the important bits renamed and reskinned to be alien themed. That doesn't mean it's bad though, since it is still Civ 5 after all. And just like Civ 5, it has an excellent soundtrack, a fast interface, and a compelling and addicting never-ending gameplay formula that knows how to keep you playing forever. At the very least, what this game does give us is proof that Firaxis can still make a good game, even when they're just phoning it in.